lovely. There are sign-up sheets, so if you wish to speak, please make sure you sign up in the right out in the hallway, right? Okay. And um, the purpose of tonight's public hearing is to give the Green Mountain Care Board an opportunity to hear from the public about their comments about the QHP filings, which are the exchange health insurance plans. And uh, we're going to get started right away because we want to make sure that everybody who wants to speak gets a chance to speak. Um, hopefully some more people are signing up. The first person to sign up was Mark Stanislaus. Mark, if you could step forward. I, and my understanding is we have been asked for you to say your name and then spell your last name so it can be accurately recorded. And I'll also add, we're trying to make sure everyone gets heard tonight, so if you can keep your comments to around three minutes or under, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Mark Stanislaus, Stanislaus, S-T-A-N-I-S-L-A-S, from St. Albans, Vermont, and I work for the University of Vermont Health. Network. And again, Mark, if you could use your, your okay. theater okay. voice, because okay. the people behind you don't want to just okay. not hear anything. <laughs> Mark, if you step up to the mic a little bit closer, I'm trying to find two of the things here. Hello. Mark Stanislaus. Hello. Here we've got something there. It's coming back here. It is. Okay, okay. good. Okay. Anyways. You might want to talk right into it. Yeah. <laughs> there's a presentation here. I would just stick to the talking points to see if there's more questions. Okay, but, you know, at a very, very high level, you know, this is about connecting the dots. It's, this is about connecting the dots between two separate processes. Uh, and if we go to slide two, okay, the backdrop of this is, you know, this is more of a conversation of how do we engage in a starting point here. So um, that's all this is. You know, the data elements may not be perfect. All of the data elements are from Green Mountain Care Boards in, you know, processes or posted on their website or either information, you know, gathered from Green Mountain Care Board staff or hearings. Okay. So basically, you know, we, we know where to start. Um, I picked four areas to start the conversation or to put out there to start to engage in the conversation and made some general observations on each one uh, of those four areas of focus. Moving on to slide four. And basically, here's the issue at hand. You know, that's the same grid that you saw on the first slide. What is driving the difference between hospital approved rates and commercial insurer approved rates? You know, these rates have been more in line through 2016, and they become they started to become a little bit distinctively different in 2017 moving forward. And it's just how do we connect those dots? And there's footnotes at the bottom um, as it relates to those data elements. All 2019 rates are based upon submitted rates, and you know none of those have been approved based upon my understanding. So this whole presentation is about how do we connect those dots between those two processes and you know and you know where to start. So I'm going to start by saying I've been doing this for more than 20 years. Okay? And it's difficult for me to connect those dots. So I can just imagine how it is for the consumer to connect those dots you know, you know, between the two processes, when to the commoner it seems like they should be easy to connect, but they're simply not today. Okay, so so basically, I took all of my 20 years of experience and I sat down and I just thought about this. Going to slide six. Okay, we know there's some various talking points there, but I will go right to the bottom. It's complicated. It really is complicated, okay? And basically what helped me to start, start, connect the dots, and you're gonna hear me use the word start, initial observations, because more people need to be engaged in, in this conversation uh, to help improve that connectivity. But basically it took me a line three years of great filings, which is on a later page, to start to see how we can start to connect those dots. Okay, so item number one of the four items that's on slide seven, very simplistically, the payer plans process starts in January, 
the hospital process starts in October. Okay, those are two different kind of starting periods. If we go to initial observations on slide eight, jumping right to the bottom, okay, okay, it's going to be very difficult to change either one of those, you know, starting periods. It is highly unlikely. So the best that I think that we can do is start to understand what the impact of the differences of, of, of those are and, you know, start to work better to make that interpretation, you know, from one to the other. Okay. Observation number two is, is the base, you know, starting period. Um, commercial insurance process starts with actual and then they make adjustments well from there, projections well from there, okay? Well, the budget review process is budget to budget. There's definitely an opportunity to better align those, okay? And um, it would require a lot of conversations and a lot of people pulling in the same direction, but I think there's a possibility there. Mark, can I ask you to speed up? We have a lot of people coming yeah, yeah, in okay. and we want to limit the time for everyone. You, you I'm going as fast as I can, okay? I, okay, yeah, okay. finish up. Okay. And anything that you don't get to, you obviously can submit it right in. Yep, and, 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 and that's why I'm trying to go through these slides too, so, and this will be submitted also. So, you know, on the core definitions, um, the commercial process is PM, PM change. The hospital review process focuses on total, total patient revenue change well, from period to period. Initial observations that comparing these two definitions are apples and oranges. You know, those two processes do not talk to each other very well. So basically, is there opportunity to start to initiate the PMPM process into the budget review process. It's gonna take time to do that, yes. Number four, okay, there are a number of items that are outside the Green Mountain Care Board hospital review process that are included in the commercial rate file. And it's going to be very critical to understand that. If we go to slide 13 and just speak to some of these initial observations, uh, based, up, based upon the Blue Cross Blue Shield presentation, they said that 53% of the medical pains experience only falls under the Green Not Care Board Raw Review. There is a little grid down below on slide 13 on how that could be better aligned. I think this process could start for FY19. Okay, there are other areas, you know, that we could do in FY19. I can speak to the board a little bit later exactly, you know, what they are. But I think we could start to start to take a look at a very high level at that actual starting place and understand the change from FY 2017 actual to 2019 budget and how that compares to some of the previous rate filings. Mark, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you could close up right now because we have a number of people here and there's still people signing up. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I have two more slides. So if you go to slide 14 there, this is just the attempt of aligning all three of those years together that helped me at least start connecting these dots. And this is going to be critical connecting those two pieces. Um, and then if you go to the last slide, um, you know, uh, you know, slide 16, it just this is exactly where we start. This connectivity isn't there today, and if it is there, it's not very clear, and it's certainly not clear to me of, you know, somebody that has a vast amount of experience. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next is Nancy Ditra, and right after that, if we can get Megan Gardner to be ready. Is Nancy here? Yep. And again, for those who came in late, when you come up, um, Please say your name and then spell your last name so it can get accurately reported. Hi, I'm Nancy Detra, D-E-T-R-A. And I'm from Guilford, Vermont. I live with depression and with good care on my part and the part of my doctor, I've been mostly healthy. Last summer I fell into a deep depression. I was taking two antidepressants which together had kept me stable for a long time 
but I found that those medicines no longer held the depression at bay, even when my psychiatrist adjusted the dosages. She then suggested I try transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, to control the illness. She believed it was my best shot at regaining my health. I had Blue Cross Blue Shield as my insurance provider through Vermont Health Connects until I was told that it would not pay for TMS. Then I switched to MVP, which would pay for it, but only after I had proved that I had reached rock bottom in my depression. I had to get worse before they would pay to help me get better. What should have been a decision between me and my doctor was dictated by the insurance company. When I finally got to have the treatment, I did get better, and maintenance treatments, which MVP approved, have kept me healthy. But when I turned 65 in June, I went on Medicare, parts A and B, Medicare part D through Humana, and a supplemental insurance through, again, Blue Cross Blue Shield. In total, I'm paying $338 per month for health insurance. Because Medicare will not pay for maintenance TMS, I'm paying an additional $600 per month for treatments every other week. If Blue Cross Blue Shield rates go up, I won't be able to afford both the insurance and the TMS maintenance treatments. I can almost guarantee I'll reach a personal health crisis is just a question of when. This is not health care. It's a lottery and a very expensive one. I urge the Green Mountain Care Board to deny rate increases and move to a universal care system as outlined in Act 48. Thank you. Thank you. Family member 
who is very uh, unemployed, low income, um, and it's a constant struggle. This is a constant struggle to find uh, money to for this person's uh, health care. And all around me, I see people, low income people, or people uh, you know, on the margins who are struggling to have a basic, the basic right of health care. It doesn't feel right. It's already very difficult for people to uh, afford health care. And now there's another, yet another raise. It doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't feel humane. It doesn't feel right that uh, people have to suffer so much and become so strapped in order to pay for their basic income. It doesn't feel right. And now the rates are going up. So I protest that. I think it's I think it's terrible. So that's what I have to say. Christine Smith, and after that is Avery Book. <coughs> <coughs> My name is Christine Smith, S-M-I-T-H. I live in Mary. I've been here five years. And I was at, when you guys had the um, Green Mountain Care Board down at City Center last year. I don't know if anybody remembers me from there. Yeah. <laughs> I've changed a little bit. Um, but I, the ones that stopped outside and spoke to our group, I want to applaud you. You have heart to know what we're going through. I didn't write anything down, so I'm just taking this from my brain and what I can remember. Um, last year, Blue Cross Blue Shield got somewhat what they wanted. More money, more hikes. What is the elderly people supposed to do who cannot afford it? You guys keep raising it, basically we're all gonna to go to hell because we can't afford it. I'm on disability. I take care of my mom since I've been 18. And I think a couple of you remember that I said this last year. I was in high school when I was taking care of my mom. I just had surgery this year on my stomach. And if it wasn't for the insurance I have, I would probably be dead. Or I would be having more problems than what I am having now. The Act 48 needs to be pushed. And I hope and pray that all of you guys have a heart and, and do not give Blue Cross Blue Shield what they want. Because the more we give, the more we're out, period. Think of the people, think of the, think of the people who don't have nothing at all. And if you guys have heart and dignity, you guys won't give them this increase, period. Thank you. Hi, my name is Avery Book, that's B-O-O-K. Uh, I live in Plainfield, I'm a member of the Vermont Worker Center. I've spent most of my adult life either uninsured or underinsured, and I've experienced firsthand the way our current healthcare system prioritizes <coughs> profits over, over human rights. Six years ago, I had an operation uh, to repair an inguinal hernia. I had noticed the hernia several years before that, but I was uninsured then, so I had to ignore it until I had insurance. In February of 2012, the, it became too painful to ignore, and I luckily was insured um, by my employer at the time. Um, after the surgery, I was left with several weeks of recovery and $4,000 worth of deductibles, co-pays, and various out-of-pocket expenses. I was with insurance, $4,000. Fast forward to spring of last year, I was doing my taxes, I was self-employed, and I'd been on uh, Vermont Health Connect for several years at that point. Uh, I was on Blue Cross Blue Shield's bronze plan, the only one I could afford. Uh, ironically, I, I uh, tended to avoid getting care whenever I could because I had a $6,000 deductible. 
Uh, I found out that Pakistan had actually had made too much that past year um, in relation to the subsidies I was receiving for my plan, and I owed over $1,300. I couldn't afford to pay that. Um, I would have signed up for a better plan had I been able to afford that. So I, I ended up uh, paying for the next 13 months a tax payment plan, slowly paying that back. Fast forward to this year, in April um, of this year, I woke up one morning with my right eye red and swollen. It looked like someone had basically punched me in the night, um, which obviously uh, had me concerned. So I went to urgent care. They suspected it was an infection, gave me some antibiotics and a topical cream. Um, at this point, I, I was now on Medicaid, so I didn't have any out-of-pocket expenses and only had to pay a dollar for the antibiotics. Um, the antibiotics didn't really do a whole lot, so they prescribed some stronger antibiotics. Those didn't work either, so they finally uh, uh, recommended me to a specialist who ended up diagnosing it as a, a chalazian, the clogging of the oil glands around your eyelashes. Um, and they, they did an incision to drain the swelling. It's, it, I don't know if you can see from there, it's not actually completely fixed, but helped a little bit. Right now I make just under the limit for Medicaid, which is $13.97 per month for a single adult here in Vermont. Um, that's not a lot of money. That's a, out of that, I need to figure out how to pay for rent, groceries, uh, car insurance, car repairs, my uh, student loans, utilities. And as probably most of you know, generally cost of living is going up in Vermont, not the other way around. Um, on the other hand, I'm uh, pretty terrified about the idea of suddenly making too much money and going back on Vermont Health Connect. If I had been um, dealing with this, my eye, while I was on my old bronze plan, I probably would be thousands of dollars in debt. Um, and, and those healthcare costs would be pushing me back towards the edge and pushing me back towards poverty. And this is a real worry for me and, and thousands of other people in this state. Uh, and I'm, so basically in conclusion, I'm tired of having to jump out of one frying pan into another fire. And I think that we need to have no more rate increases. We need to treat healthcare like a human right. Um, we need universal healthcare through implementation of Act 48. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tev Kelman, uh, P E V K E L M A N. Uh, I'm a member of the Mark Worker Center. I live in Washington. Um, I also teach at Randolph Union High School. Um, I'm, as a teacher, I see the healthcare crisis that we have in this state every day in my classroom. I teach in a community where the proportion of families in poverty has climbed from 20 to over 50% in the little less than a decade that I've been there. Um, and a tremendous amount of that uh, is related to the increasing cost of health care. This board has approved rate increases over the past four years on an average of almost 40%. Um, my wages have not gone up anywhere close to 40%, and I can bet that very few of the people who are sitting in this room have seen anything like that. So we're seeing this incredible spike in, in the unaffordability of something that, as you're hearing, should be a basic human right. And as a matter of fact, in our state's law, in Act 48, is defined as a basic right. And I believe that that same law um, tasks all of you with moving us toward a system that treats healthcare as uh, a public good and a right rather than as a commodity. When we instead continue to prop up this system um, that allows corporations, um, you know, financial solvency to be placed above the ability of working families to access the care they need, it takes a toll on kids. I myself am lucky enough to have a, a plan through my job that, you know, I'd like to pay less, but but I can afford it and whatever rate increases, it's not gonna put us out. But I, my wife and I recently had a baby, and that's an expensive proposition. And had we been in a slightly different situation, we would be in thousands and thousands of dollars worth of medical debt. And I know this because the families that I serve are struggling with that situation. And when families can't access the care they need, or when they struggle to afford their premiums, or fall into the Medicaid gap, their kids suffer, and their learning suffers whether that's directly through unmet physical and mental health uh, needs, or indirectly through the stress that it causes uh, to the parents trying to make ends meet and pay for these rising premiums that we keep seeing. Um, so I'd also like to say that um, in, you know, with regard to this particular hearing, um, 
I, I teach English, and you all have, have provided really an object lesson in irony by denying the public advocate the chance to speak at this hearing. Um, I think you know this is the second time I've been, but I know that, that the Workers' Center has been sending folks to these hearings for a long time. We've been saying the same thing. We can't afford these rate increases. We can't afford any rate increases. We want a publicly funded universal system that allows everybody to get the care they need. And we wanted it in 2011 when we passed this law. We can't afford any more rate heights. Health care is a human right. Thank you. My name is Kurt Erickson, last name E-R-I-C-K-S-E-N. Uh, I'm a resident of Montpelier, Vermont, um, veteran of the United States Coast Guard and currently general manager of Vermont Compost Company. Um, at Vermont Compost Company, we have 18 full-time employees, you know, most of them around my age, my you know, uh, annual salary level. Uh, you know, we're, we're mostly supporting local, small-scale organic agriculture throughout the Northeast and the Midwest. So we have a lot of people that are fine making a little bit less money. You know, it's, it's passion-driven work. As a company, we don't have the, the margin to where I can afford to pay a proper health care plan. So we, we take the fine by the state each year. And what I say to my staff is anyone that wants to go out on the market get health care through Vermont Health Connect, we'll, we'll reimburse 50% of what that cost is. What I can say is that with 18 full-time staff, they look at the return on that investment just as, as a poor investment. So when they see the cost of what their health insurance is compared to the cost that they're gonna be stuck with anyway, coming in and out of a hospital, for people mostly between you know, 25 and 42, it's, it's just a poor investment. I personally am paying $386 a month for a plan because I'm, I'm like, you know, well, especially coming from the Coast Guard, I'm like, understand the, the value and sort of, um, you know, the pressure that you don't have in your life by knowing that you have those costs covered. Um, but when I look at rate increases and I think about the fact that I could be spending $400, $450, $500 a month, you know, in comparison to what my needs are on any given basis, the fact that I have a whole staff that's like, health, health insurance is, is a bad return on investment. I'm just not seeing it. It's taking seven years, 10 years, 12 years before there's a, a bad enough incident or there's something terrible enough in my life to where it makes it, it where it's worth it for me to, to put this money out each month. So when I look at, at rate increases, it's not, you know, should they do it or should they not? Should it be universal health care? I'm like, just from a practical, from a practical standpoint, it's there's the, the return on investment at the current price isn't there. You know, like there's there's just not enough benefit. So to think that that, that can be increased and then, you know, when you couple that with sort of some of the, the ridiculous charges that people are getting coming out of hospitals, um, it's like pretty much everybody, my entire staff, is disgusted with the whole healthcare system right now. And whether it's Act 148 or Act 48 or another method, I don't know what the answer is, but I just know that they're disgusting. And if if Vermont is concerned about keeping, you know, people in that age bracket with decent insurance, they've got to do something about it. And allowing rate increases is not, it, it's not going to help. You're, you're going to, I will guarantee you that the number of insured individuals between 25 and 45 is going to, to drop. And that's a problem. Like, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone's aware of the risks that I have and, you know, people getting under debt and all of that. Um, sorry, I'm a poor public speaker, so. Uh, Doing fine. Yeah. Anyway, so, and the other thing is as a small business, you know, when I hear about Act 48 and the support for that, when I think about as a, a small business, the, the most beneficial thing out there is decent healthcare coverage at a reasonable cost. You know, so if I had the ability to provide better health care for employees, I'd be a whole lot better at, at, at recruiting talent. And, and it's, a, it's a huge obstacle, and right now the, the state is failing. Thank you.
Good afternoon, I'm Manny Mansbach. That's M-A-N-S-B-A-C-H. I live in Athens, Vermont. Can you hear me? Uh, in 2012, at age 52, with a very good health history and many more good health habits than bad ones, I found myself in and out of the hospital three times in five weeks. Through no fault of my own, I'd contracted a common virus that led to a dangerous, if untreated, inflammation of the sac that surrounds the heart, known as pericarditis. I was able to receive very helpful life-saving emergency and follow-up care, and I came out more or less okay in this situation and was told I'd have no greater chance of developing heart disease than the average person. I was fortunate to have lived at that time in Massachusetts, and had I not been enrolled in mass health at that time, in addition to my medical problems, I would have been in a world of hurt financially as the ordeal involved a number of very expensive procedures in addition to the cost of several days in the hospital. So now I'm concerned that as Congress and the administration in Washington seek to destroy Medicaid and other aspects of our social contract, that if I become ineligible for Medicaid because I make a few dollars too much, that Vermont health care plans will be exorbitant and like people have been talking about, eat up hefty chunks of my resources and the resources of other Vermonters. I'm confident that this board understands that Vermonters aren't getting wealthier in proportion to the increases that Blue Cross and MVP request annually, including this year. And as someone else mentioned, I think it's a great injustice that uh, these companies didn't think that they could count on their own arguments and data to get the heights they want, but felt it was also necessary to employ fancy legal maneuvers to file, uh, to silence Mr. Fisher. Uh, an important, in this context, essential voice of advocacy for the people affected by these rates. I think this is shameful and sleazy and shows the desperation that those who are managing our healthcare system will go to get their way. If you don't like the message, silence the messenger or call it fake news in bold caps on Twitter. As a healthcare professional, a, men a mental healthcare professional, for almost 30 years, I'm very aware of the stressors that contribute to people's disease. It breaks my heart to witness that in this, the wealthiest country in the history of the planet, anxiety about difficulty accessing healthcare is rapidly growing as a stressor in and of itself that undermines good health. It's a vicious cycle. As a large segment of the very rich get still richer and commit themselves to undermining the social safety net that I sh believe should be a given for all, not only are people finding it difficult to access effective healthcare, but the worry about this is itself becoming a factor that makes well-being more elusive. While I imagine that some members of this board sincerely believe that you're serving the public good as best you can, I suspect and frankly hope that somewhere in some part of your mind, you know that when you more or less rubber stamp most of what the insurance companies ask for, you're participating in an exercise that amounts to little more than rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. That each year in these hearings, you're deciding not whether or how healthcare should be available to folks, but to what degree you're gonna continue the trend under these Republican administrations of saying to decent, hardworking people, you're sick, too bad, good luck, as you continue to make it harder for people to afford healthcare. If you continue in this vein without doing the hard work, of working to enact Act 48, which is the law of the state, then, then I think you're really not serving the public good. Ordinary Vermonters insist that you help fulfill the promise of Act 48 and work to develop a system that treats healthcare as a fundamental right for every Vermonter, no matter who they are or how privileged they are or aren't. Please do your real job. Bisbee, and as some of you know, I sat for the first part of the Blue Cross Blue Shield hearing the other uh, yesterday, and couldn't stand anymore when you when you left for 15 minutes for lunch. I decided that was all I could take. Uh, my name is Mary Alice, common spelling Bisbee, B-I-S-B-E-E. -E. I'm a native Vermonter, seventh generation Vermonter, and the only person I remember seeing when that I know is Robin from, from the Green Mountain Care Board. The whole 
board has changed politically, I think, in this, in this atmosphere. So uh, I have been a, a, an advocate for universal care, um, single payer health care for so long, since the 1960s, I believe. I'm 81 years old. I've seen a lot of changes. I've gone through a lot of changes. And when I was 34 years old as a young mother with two children, my ex-husband, an MIT graduate, decided to move back to Vermont after we'd been all over the country. And I had a nervous breakdown after smoking one joint of marijuana. Uh, and a week later, I had a psychotic break. It threw my life into turmoil. As most of you know, I now live in subsidized housing. I'm very grateful for three squares. They give me $15 a month. Um, and I get a few other services, but I will not take Blue Cross Blue Shield or MVP. I have United Healthcare, and I've been grandfathered in. And I know people will say that's ridiculous; they're terrible. But uh, they have grandfathered me in, so that if I go in the hospital and need to be in rehab and get any kind of home health or rehab services, I pay no deductible, no copay. And this is all due to the, what different people have changed in the legislation that you have brought about and here. We need universal primary care first, and I fought for that at the State House. Nobody listened. Nobody listened. Uh, we need universal care around the country. Uh, and to think that we're the, we're the richest country in the world and we do not have this is ridiculous and I feel terrible. I know most of you earn over $80,000 $80, a year just to sit on this board. What are, what are they doing? What are you doing to help us? I don't see anything being done. I see us going up 6.9%. I listened to that hearing the other day. His name was uh, uh, Jay Inkhoff, talking about what is affordability. Nobody can even define it, right? We don't know what affordability is. I've got my notes here. $63 million is supposed to be coming back to Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And they didn't even put that into their, the, uh, the uh, person who spoke, uh, Mr. Schultz, I think his name was, uh, said that, that they, they couldn't even uh, put that in because they hadn't received it yet. And that Vermont has these horrible rules about rules about uh, that ages can't, people that are younger people have to pay the same as older people and all these wonderful rules that we put in are now coming back to haunt us because the insurance companies, and, and the insurance companies blame the hospitals for the high rates, the hospitals blame the insurance companies. And what about the consumers? I'll, I'll, I'll let it go with that, but uh, I'm also a member of I don't pay my dues because I don't have much money, but I, I'm with rights and democracy too, and I'm with uh, health care for all and a lot of other in groups that are working to, to find something in our state that will meet up to our goals and our, our heart. Thank you. Spoon Agave. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grace Benenson, last name B E N I N S O N. In 2014, after working for the same company for almost 20 years, I suffered a massive stroke, and the result. What resulted in that stroke was because I had a high deductible insurance plan and I wasn't able to afford to go to the doctor. And they didn't diagnose that I was pre-diabetic and I had this massive infection that caused my blood sugar to skyrocket that caused the stroke. And as a result of that stroke, I no longer am able to work and be a contributing member of society. So I put my efforts into helping other people to be in the same position and trying to let people know that if you're not paying attention to what's going on around you, everything that you 
think is yours is not really yours. You're going to lose it. I lost my house. I lost my job. The only thing I didn't lose was my desire to fight for better health care and reasonable, reasonable accommodation for people. I'll keep fighting for that for the rest of my life. And I, I'm terrified that if I get sick again for some reason, I have Medicare. And every spent cent of my resources are gone. I have nothing left. I get a small amount of disability every month, which is not enough to keep me in, able to have an apartment or anything. So I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to live with friends and the kindness of my friends is what pulled me through all of this. And the people who are here from Vermont Workers Center have been a huge part of that. And the other people in the Brattleboro area who understand what happens to people when, when they have a catastrophe like this. And I have no, no redress to the insurance company. They won't say to me, we're sorry, Grace, that you lost everything that you worked for for your whole life because you couldn't afford to go to the doctor. So nobody's going to say they're sorry to me, and I don't expect them to. But I, what they can expect from me is that I'm going to keep fighting against rate increases and high deductibles for human beings so they can survive in the world. Thank you very much for your time. I'm Spoon Agave, A-G-A-V-E. Um, I'm going to approach this uh, from two angles. One is, as a school board member in Brattleboro, uh, I deal with with all the other members and everybody else there at virtually every meeting with issues related to poverty because we see them as issues with the kids. Uh, we have, a, I think, a, about the lowest average household income in the state in uh, the Rattleboro. So we have a very high rate of poverty. So anything that happens that puts even more stress on these families reverberates to more problems with the kids, more expenses in the schools. We've gone to a point now where every school has to have a social worker. Soon we're going to be hiring, hiring social workers that know a little bit about teaching. And it, it's, it's just real serious and it's so obvious that so much of these, uh, many of these uh, special needs are coming out of poverty and health care, the, the cost of health care is a huge contributor to that poverty. Um, and then the second way that I, I want to approach my concerns about health care is as a retired person, my income is $1,274 a month from Social Security, which is just about the, the average across the country for people receiving uh, that. And um, fortunately, I still have enough health to pick up a little under the table work and I have a little bit of savings. So I'm managing okay. Nevertheless, uh, between my supplementary or gap insurance, uh, I get some help. I get some Medicaid uh, through that, I think helping me the farm program and uh, something that helps me pay some of my Part B, but I have the gap insurance, uh, I have part of the Part B and, and I have some co-pays and I have co-pays on my drugs for my emphysema. I put out about $200 a month on average or a little less. Um, out of my official income of $1,274 a month. And that the, is in the near future within, I don't know how, I hope not, not as soon as, uh, in, but if I lose that extra income and my savings are gone, I'm in trouble. So for, for me, I'm just, I'm like a, probably a very large <coughs> slice of the uh, population that sits in retirement and right on the edge. Thank you.
Hi. My name is Ellen Schwartz, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. I'm from Brattleboro, and I'm a member of the Vermont Workers' Center. Um, I'm on Medicare, which means that I am not directly impacted by these proposed increases, though I do remember a time in my younger years when I was uninsured, and I remember how scary that was. Um, in this country, if you're old, like me, you're deemed worthy of access to health care. Well, at least at 80% of the cost. I'm speaking today because I cannot sit in silence just because I have the good fortune to benefit from a public health care program while others are priced out of the health care marketplace. That is our current reality, and these increases, if granted, will only intensify and extend the damage. The real problem is that we have a health care marketplace at all. Healthcare shouldn't be treated as a consumer good, accessible to some but not to others. It's a need that we all have by virtue of being human. I'm guessing that you, those of you on the board, like me, can access care when you need it. As you consider the rate hike requests, I implore you to think about the people in your lives, people that you know and that you love, and ask yourself which of those people deserves not to have health care. To which of those people would you say, sorry, the premium's too high, or too bad you can only afford a high deductible plan? I hope that you would never relegate that someone you care about to that fate, and that as a public board, you would take seriously your obligation to all Vermont residents. I also have serious concerns about how independent the board is of the insurance companies. The Green Mountain Care Board was established under Act 48 as an independent board I've been attending these meetings, these hearings, since they began. And this year, for the first time, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate has been blocked from weighing in. So how independent is the board of the insurance companies? It looks to me like they get to call the shots about who counts and who doesn't. The only voice the people of Vermont have is the testimonies that you receive from people like us here tonight, which, are, if I remember from last year's hearing, we were told they don't actually count since none of us have party status. Until this year, we were also represented by the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, and now that voice has also been removed. So from where I sit, it looks like the board is not independent of the insurance companies. You're supposed to be a regulatory body, but how can you fulfill that function if the only testimony that counts comes from the very companies that you're regulating? According to Act 48, which established the Green Mountain Care Board, the board's first aim is to improve the health of the population. That same law states that systemic barriers such as cost must not prevent people from ex accessing necessary health care. That's actually a quote from the law. Your board has both a moral and a legal imperative to ensure that premiums do not stand between people and needed care. Ultimately, the solution, as spelled out in Act 48, is a universal publicly funded health care system. I urge you to reject the rate increases and to do all within your power to move us to the full implementation of Act 48 with the promise of Green Mountain Care, not as Medicaid, but as a public system for every Vermont resident, so people never again have to come before this board pleading for the basic human right to health care. Thank you. Kevin Wagner, W-A-G-N-E-R. I'm from Bradford, and I get health insurance through Vermont Health Connect, not through MVP. And I'm starting to reach an age when I'm not as healthy as I used to be, and healthcare is becoming an increasing concern for me and for my wife. And 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 because of the high, the high deductibles we pay for our plan, like every time we need care, it's a matter of we're, we're, we're going to be paying for it for months in the future, and, that, and that's, it, it's definitely a barrier for us, and it, 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 it does cause us to like restrict the care that we seek, and, and, it's, and, and we're, we're fortunate that we don't have anything truly serious afflicting us at the moment, but it's, you know, it's seriously anxiety-inducing knowing that if, if something serious does occur, yeah, how, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to, how, how, how are we going to continue to live dignified lives? And 
I, I, I hear a lot of discussion from and around the board over you know, what's the financial viability of, of the insurance companies, um, but <clears throat> Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't have a right to live. It, People have a right to live. Healthcare should be treated. Healthcare should be treated as a human right, a public good for all. Thank you. Amy Lester, L-E-S-T-E-R, Adamant, Vermont. Ray Hikes. I'm very familiar with Ray Hikes. Uh, I first became familiar in 2004 when I was a school teacher in Barrie and Blue Cross Blue Shield hiked our rates at 6%. We went on strike the next year. It's 2018 and I believe that this issue of rate hikes and teachers and um, paying public workers um, is still a big issue. It's still happening. In 2005, Healthcare is a Human Right campaign first began. It's 13 years later and we're still here. The Blue Cross Blue Shield CEO is still making more and more money and we are making less and less money and more people are without insurance, underinsured, or dealing with huge gaps. I'm now a small business owner and I recognize that the differences that these hikes make not only affect me personally and my colleagues, but also the taxpayers and also the folks that I could potentially be hiring but I can't afford to. Can I increase my services to clean homes and do residential painting to keep up with these costs? I'm gonna lose bids, I'm gonna lose businesses. I feel fortunate that I can pay. I think that I want to be able to pay into a system, and that's what universal health care is all about. If I make less money, then I might go down in my tax bracket or go down in the levels, and I'll be um, possibly eligible for Medicaid. I believe that all we're all in. It's an equitable, fair, transparent um, health care system that we need. Act 48 is a start, but we really need an expanded Medicaid plan that's for all, health care for all. No more rate increases, and health care is a basic human right. Thank you. Before you go to Walter, I see the health care advocate is by the door, and I don't want him to leave without giving him an opportunity. Can I have 30 seconds? It would I mean, be great because <laughs> Can I have three there, seconds? there seems to be a big misconception yeah. here. And if you could explain that your office has been involved from the beginning. Good, good afternoon. Um, I, I just want to take two seconds to say that I'm Mike Fisher. I'm the healthcare advocate. And to let people know that I was able to speak today at the um, MVP hearing. I just thought people should know that when they're getting up to speak. And you guys are doing great. Hmm. It's more than just getting an opportunity to speak. What his office has done is they have party status to the hearings. And uh, they have been involved in asking questions from the first date that the filing was made. And uh, Mike deserves that round of applause you just gave him and more for the hard work that he's been doing. Hello, my name is Walter Carpenter, C-A-R-P-E-N-T-E-R. -E -E I am a health activist with Dr. Deb Richter, Dr. Deb Richter in Vermont Healthcare for All. And I thank the Care Board for hosting this public hearing. And something that I know was rare for me and that the board members cursed know me might be shocked by, I do not have much to add to the testimony you have heard and will hear tonight. We are shocked. Well, we are shocked. <laughs> so am I, actually. Many years ago, long before the Green Mountain Care Board was a gleam in our eyes, I had Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance through an employer. 
In 23, 2003, I had my gallbladder taken out of me after a massive gallbladder attack. The copay was $50. A year later, it was the turn of a colonoscopy. Great fun that was. The copay suddenly jumped to 250. When I inquired of my insurer, they said our costs went up. My wages did not go up to meet your costs, I replied. Yes, no problem. Several years later, one of their CEOs retired with a seven plus million dollar golden parachute. That, however, is not what I want to say here. According to an article in Seven Days, Blue Cross Blue Shield collects millions from Vermonters each month. It's also a nonprofit. Also, according to Seven Days piece, Blue Cross Blue Shield does not pay state taxes. This means that we, the people, pay state taxes that they do not pay. Since we subsidize Blue Cross Blue Shield with our premiums and so on, we are also subsidizing them with the state taxes that we do pay on their behalf. In essence, we are being double taxed to support Blue Cross Blue Shield. No matter how you cut it, the premium is a form of tax. The thought I want to leave here was spoken by Dr. Deb Richter of Vermont Healthcare for All in that seven days article on Blue Cross. Dr. Richter posed a rhetorical question about the purpose of Blue Cross versus us. Do they exist for our benefit or do we exist for theirs? This is the ultimate question we need to ask ourselves. Thanks again. Someway followed by Alec Fleischer. I'm going to read my own testimony as well as a friend of a friend who's a teacher in Springfield. Um, I'm going to start with Amanda Frank, a teacher in Springfield. Hello, my name is Amanda Frank. I live in Belmont, Vermont and teach in Springfield. Having, a master, having my master's degrees and 10 years of teaching experience, I take home $1,811 every two weeks. My husband is a stay-at-home dad, so we are in a one-income family, high deductibles, and the flawed mantra of more skin in the game are threatening my family's already precarious financial situation. A rate hike would not only cause further financial strain, but also put the health of my family members at risk. Despite having both an FSA and HRA, I must pay up front for prescriptions and wait several weeks for the claim to be processed by Blue Cross Blue Shield and the third party administrator for reimbursed. Currently, I'm waiting to be reimbursed for prescriptions from June and July, $1,263, 35% of my monthly take-home pay. One of our family members has a chronic condition. So far, we've been able to continue filling all prescriptions, but an increase in premium costs will only push us closer to having to make the unthinkable choice of which prescriptions to fill and which to go without, a choice some of my colleagues have already had to make. This is why we're saying today, healthcare is a human right, no more rate hikes, universal healthcare now. Now for my own testimony. Hello, my name is Griffin Chumway, that's my real name, uh, S-H-U-M-W-A-Y. I live in Wilder and I'm a member of the Vermont Worker Center. This is the third year I've been to this testimony to speak to you all. This is the third year that my wages haven't raised at the same rate that Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP are asking their wages to be raised, or their rates to be raised. Um, I, I hate to say this, but I plan to be here next year because CEO's pays will rise and my wages won't. Um, and I still won't be able to see a doctor. Uh, this is true not just for me, but for people all across the state. In 2011, the Green Mountain Care Board was tasked with figuring out universal health care. And this rate increase, guess what? It's not universal health care. Um, this is, in fact, a giveaway to the CEOs of Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP. We know that um, because their spokespeople who spoke to you yesterday and today actually advocated uh, made a motion, I believe it's called, to have the, the public advocate not speak. You guys to speak, that's great. But we know that the, the CEO, that the CEO uh, is interested only in raising rates and not in our livelihoods, because the people that are representing us were asked not to speak. Um, I'm here to tell you uh, that I'm gonna be back. I'll be back next year, I'll be back the year after that. I'll be there, I'll be here until you all figure out what your job is, which in Act 48 is to implement universal health care. Um, that's why I'm saying no more rates, no more rate hikes. Um, health care is a human right. 
Universe Healthcare now. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Alec Fleischer, F L E I S C H E R. I'm a student at Middlebury College and I have an internship here in Montpelier this summer. I've had the honor of hearing Professor Holmes speak before. Um, I just want to start off with you guys know a lot more than we do. You're very technical and you know the details. But we do know the morals. You've heard the stories today and you really please try to take that into account. Blue Cross Blue Shields has is trying to raise rates, as you know, 7.5% this year and 36% since 2014. This is at the same time their holding company, Anthem, it's a public for-profit corporation. I just looked it up. Five years ago, their stock price was $84.79. Today, their stock price is $246.08. That's a 290% increase. Has anyone here made any of that money? All they've seen is their rates increase. And to be precise, 36% since 2014. Probably more than that if you go back five years. So the real question is, should Vermonters be able to pay for insurance? Or should for-profit corporations make more and more money to benefit only their shareholders? And I just want to say, everything you do is political. You're trying to be an apolitical body. But if you take a stand and say, no, no more rate hikes, what will happen? Maybe we'll make the news. Maybe nothing will happen. But you will have at least a spark in funding Act 48 so everyone here can have insurance and every Vermonter can get the health care they need. Everything you do is political, so please take a stand. You are on an incredible pedestal, and please use that power. Thank you, and thank you for listening to us. That's followed by uh, Keegan Harris, and that is all the names I have. If anyone has not signed up, there's one more, I believe. Um, please let um, Agatha, who's out by the door, know. Hi, my name is Eliza Hale, uh, H-A-L-E. Um, I live in Washington, Vermont. Um, I recently I had a, a baby um, this past spring in May, and uh, at the time that we, she was born, um, uh, our so I, I have the fortune of being on my husband's health insurance through his work. He's a school teacher, and at the time that our daughter was born, the um, complications with their healthcare provider were underway, and there was a blackout period happening with the HRA. That handling a lot of our claims. Um, so we, we had the um, delight of getting all the bills from the hospital um, before they'd been processed. And it really made me realize um, just how, uh, how much uh, it costs to have a child. Um, and that's just the, you know, that's just the first, uh, the first piece, that's just the birth. That has nothing to do with all the costs that come down the road probably the most expensive uh, health care item that any family can have is having a, a new uh, member. And it, there's nothing like having a baby, I think, that, that makes you kind of think about the future and about um, the state of things and how the world will be when your, when your baby comes to um, uh, a point in their lives where they might want to have a child. And at the rate that the, the increases are going, the rate hikes are going, I don't think my daughter will ever have a chance to, to have a child because of how much it costs. Um, so I just think that uh, it's worth uh, investigating how, how, how your body can uh, do more to improve the lives of everyone, um, especially those in, in uh, our, our children and our children. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Keegan Harris. I live in North Thetford, Vermont. Uh, sorry, last name spelled H-A-R-R-I-S. Uh, I work as a Springfield 
school teacher. Um, you heard one of my colleagues' testimonies earlier. I'm pretty routinely struck in conversations that I have with my colleagues, um, both teachers and support staff in the school, uh, and then most tragically with my students and their families about how they can't afford health care. And I can't afford health care. Um, it is distressing to see the cost of insurance provide a barrier to accessing the sorts of services that human beings need in order to sustain their lives. Um, healthcare costs, and in particular insurance costs, both provide those barriers and also drive us either into or deeper into poverty. And working in the community that I do, I see the effects of that pretty firsthand. Uh, our healthcare is a human right that is being denied us by the current system. And as has been frequently and eloquently portrayed by persons giving testimony before me, your board was created to see us transition to a universal healthcare system by July 1st of last year. Uh, so I'm calling on you to refuse these rate hikes and do the job for which the board was created. Give us universal health care now. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sean Stevens, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. I live in Montpelier here. Um, I find it hard to hear from back there. I don't know if anyone has access to an to a amplifier that could get turned up a little bit, but the people at the back might appreciate it. Um, I have, uh, I'm a speech and language pathologist. I work for a little nonprofit organization. Um, between the premiums that I pay and my little nonprofit organization pay to Blue Cross Blue Shield, we pay about $14,000 a year. So since I started there in 2013, we have paid Blue Cross Blue Shield $68,000. And in return for that, I have received a physical. That's all I've received, <laughs> one single physical. And I say that to set the stage for an incident that happened a year and a half ago on my son's birthday when I bought him a bow, an archery bow, which has, which has a fancy stringer, and this bow, I'll keep this short, it sounds long, but it'll be short. With a stringer, with a modern bow, you step on the stringer and pull up on the bow to put the bow string onto the tips of the bow. But the stringer slipped off, and the bow came up and hit me on the forehead above my eye, and it cracked this bone, and it punctured my eye, and I fell on the floor bleeding from the eye socket and worried that I'd cracked my skull and my son asked me should I call 911 and I was I was writhing around in a pool of my own blood I had to tell him no don't call 911 we can't afford it I feel like I never want to have other parents be in that situation I don't want to have other children be in that situation and so I would ask that we try to figure out some way to get around the situation that we're in right now. Thank you. So it appears that we've gone through everyone that signed up. I just want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity, if they haven't spoken, to come on down. Hi, my name is Britta Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R. I'll keep it very brief. I would ask the board to consider the factors that are driving up the rates as you make this decision. It's a pretty simple question. What is more important, growing the profits of the insurance companies year after year, or providing health care and ensuring the health and safety of Vermonters. Under Governor Shumlin's own plan to finance Act 48, we saw that there was enough money to fund health care for all in Vermont. This choice is a moral one, make no mistake. The function of the Green Mountain Care Board is to ensure the adequate provision of health care in Vermont 
and to ensure the transition to a universal healthcare system. We sit here today in a room far away from the hospitals, from nurses who are fighting for safe staffing, from people who are dying. That is the consequence of your decision tonight and over the course of these humans. Please don't forget that. Thank you. So just wanted one more time to give somebody, well, Mike, come on forward. <laughs> It dawns on me that I shouldn't miss an opportunity to do a quick public service announcement about a whole nother aspect of the, of the healthcare advocate's office, and that's that in addition to being a party status to issues like whether the insurance company should raise their rates, we also have a call center so that people who are having uh, issues for themselves or their families, uh, managing this very complex, often unfair, healthcare financing system, that they have an advocate that they can call and I'll just read the number real quick, 800-917-7787. Uh, You'd think I'd have that committed to memory. Um, and, uh, but you can also look us up on the web. Uh, I've got a great dedicated staff of incredible advocates who are there every day working hard for, for people. One more time, what's yes. the number? Yes, 800-917-7787. Okay, thank you. Thank you. May I ask a quick question? How do Certainly. we email our, if we do written testimony? So um, the, the best email address, Christina? gmcb.org at vermont.gov. It's also on our website, and all the information in our public comment page is a phone number, there's an email, um, and you can find any of the other emails on our website. So again, it was gmcb.org at vermont.org at vermont.gov. Does anyone else wish to speak? Yes. chair and um, I think it would be useful to have a more in-depth conversation you know with the board to understand those elements because I think there are some clear opportunities where at least we can start to connect those processes. Thank you Mark. And, and we will stay till 6 30 in case someone comes in late we do understand that um, it's not often easy for people working in Vermont to uh, get to these meetings so we will continue to be here until 6.30 because that's what it was advertised at. And uh, we don't want anyone to drive a long distance and 